dig into it. Before I do that, um, I want to, of course, pray. And before I pray, I want to read a passage of scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm sorry, chapter 2, uh, which talks about God's words and the nature of revelation and how we can know things. And then I want to show a very quick two-minute clip from Albert Moeller. And somehow we'll tie this all together. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning, let's say at verse 10, Paul is speaking here. He's talking about wisdom from the Spirit, and he's contrasting that with wisdom from the world. And he's saying here, starting at verse 10, These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thought except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Verse 14, the natural person, or you could say the person without the Spirit, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So, that's a part of a coming off of chapter 1, but as we examine these things, I just want to have that be on our minds in terms of God's revelation to us how we know things ultimately it's not reason only um, it's God's revelation okay I'll pray almighty God and father most gracious father thank you once again for this time thank you for this space here that uh RD's graciousness to allow us to meet like this and examine your word and have a Bible study at a place of work. This is a gift, and a wonderful gift, ultimately, that comes from you. And so we are grateful for that. And that being the case, Father, I pray that since we are now handling your word and turning to your word, I pray that through this spirit, your Holy Spirit, you would open our eyes, illumine us to what it is you are teaching us in your word, what you have ordained to reveal to us about yourself that we might know it and in the knowing of it be transformed and conformed to the image of your son Jesus Christ through it we know that the same spirit who inspired the apostles to write these words is the same spirit who is in us who gives us the light of illumination to understand these words and to see and cherish and treasure these precious and very great truths and today, I particularly pray for this, since we are delving into a passage of Scripture that directly talks about who you are and your character and what you are like, and again, what you would have us know about yourself. So I pray in the name of Christ, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. All right, now, here's a quick clip from Albert Moeller. This was from 2017. In what ways is our current cultural climate forcing the mushy middle out of the church? Yeah, that's a great question. And it kind of goes back to the seeker-sensitive question. We all wanted in on that one because that's where we live. But one of the interesting things to note is that there aren't many new seeker-sensitive churches because that fit a certain cultural moment when people were saying to unbelievers, you can gain a bit of social capital by coming to join with us. You can. There's some value added to your life if you come and join, join with us. If you, if you just come and, 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 and be with us, we'll add meaning and spirituality to your life in a, in a non-threatening way. But in the hardening secularization that we're now experiencing, people are going to pay social capital to hang around with anyone who believes the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're going to 
forfeit social capital. They're going to run a risk for being members of our churches. There once was a time when, especially someone in, say, a southern town, he wanted to come and he wanted to, he had his family, he wanted to be able to raise his children, wanted to be able to sell life insurance. He had to have credibility. He joined credibility by, uh, that is, add credibility by joining the First Baptist Church, First Presbyterian Church. That was just what people did in an age of cultural Christianity. Well, now you may fail to become a partner in your law firm because you're a member of a Bible-believing, gospel-teaching church. The mushy middle is disappearing because in a time of hardening, I'm not gonna use the word persecution, but in a time of hardening opposition, could well turn into persecution, people are running a risk to hang around with the likes of us. And the mushy middle is gonna disappear in a, in a, in a hurry because the pressures on both sides are coming real hard. Southern Baptist yeah, he's the uh, president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He yeah. does that show, the briefing, kind of a Chuck Colson breakpoint type of radio broadcast, yeah. current events, newspaper headlines from a Christian worldview. So that was a 2017 Ligonier Conference uh, question and answer period. But did you get the gist of it? The change in culture, the further that? polarization. Why is that real? Well, I'm going to have to somehow tie it all in after we get into this passage here, okay? Uh, Judy, we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 9 today. Yeah, and I ran out of the house without my Bible. Where's your Bible, Fred? Well, I'll run down again. Well, here, here. You can take this one, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm chasing kids, right? Oh, yeah, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay. Romans 9. Yes, so we're going to talk about Romans 9, and I'm going to do my very best to give some background as we dig into this and do some exegesis on it and uh, see what God has to say to us through this passage written by Paul. Um, as I explained to R.D., this is a, a seminal passage, it's a profound passage of Scripture that tells us some very important things about God. Um, and one way this ties into what Albert Muller was just saying is there's some offensive things in here to humans' ears, to mankind's ears about God, and uh, particularly his freedom and sovereignty in doing what he does. Paul is making the argument at the beginning of Romans chapter 9. He's coming off, of course, Romans 8. He has gone through what's called the golden chain of redemption, uh, the, one of the most precious promises of Scripture, Romans 8, starting at verse 28. Uh, for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose, he works everything for their good. And then we have mentioned foreknowledge, the golden chain, foreknowledge, predestination, justification, I'm sorry, predestination, calling, effectual calling, justification, and glorification. The response in verse 31, chapter 8, What then shall we say to these magnificent things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And he's, of course, taking into account what he's just revealed to us. After that, we come to the beginning of Romans 9. Well, you forgot 38 and 39. Romans 8, 38, 39. Right, nothing. Can separate us from the love of God. Right. Nothing. Nothing, exactly. Thank you, yes. I think that is a classic passage that, I mean, we taught the children that passage. Mm -hmm. Nothing can separate you. Right. Yeah, that's great. It is, it's a huge passage. And so, coming into Romans 9, Paul says, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness that I have great sorrow and unseeking, unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race according to the flesh is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. And here's what he says in verse 6 of chapter 9. But... It is not as though the word of God has failed. So why is he saying that? 
Paul's going to make an argument here because it looks as though God's word has failed. And why is that? Because Israel has rejected their Messiah. The Messiah who was promised to Israel has come and they crucified him. And so how, how do we reckon with that? That the promised one to Israel, they put to death, they crucified on the cross. How could that happen? And are they lost because they've done that? That seems like the word of God has failed then. And if, if, if it's failed on that account, then all of his promises cannot be relied upon. So Paul is now going to make the case why that is not so. Why the word of God has not failed. And the first thing he says in verse 6 is that not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. In verse 7, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but it is through Isaac shall your offspring be named. So first differentiation is the promised ones came through Isaac, not through who was the other son of Abraham, Ishmael who was conceived through Hagar. Right. And he's going to explain here. And that's Iran. Right, name. right. The Arab nations. The, yeah. Yeah. This means, I'm looking at verse 8 of chapter 9, this means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. So the children of the flesh. That was Abraham's and Sarah. He was complicit in it. Uh, we're not trusting in God's promise. Mm -hmm. Perhaps they can say they grew impatient. It was a really long time from when God made that promise to when they actually conceived and had Isaac. And so in their flesh, uh, Abraham went in with Hagar and, uh, and Ishmael was conceived. And so Paul is saying it's not through that line. Even though they had the same father, Abraham, it's not through that line. It's through the promise line of uh, Isaac. Now isn't that same thing taught back in Galatians? Children of promise versus... Yeah, well in Galatians, yeah, I mean, I, if, if I'm thinking... That's, that's reiterated. Yes, it's reiterated, right. Mm -hmm. um, verse 9, For this is what the promise said, About this time next year I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. Then he goes even deeper here. In verse 10 of Romans 9, Paul says, Not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac. Verse 11, Though they were not yet born or had done anything neither good nor bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. So Paul has gone from Abraham and Sarah and distinguishing the, the two lines that came from Abraham. Ishmael is out. Mm -hmm. Ishmael and Hagar, that line is not the children of the promise. They're not true Israelites. Mm -hmm. It's the children of it's Isaac that, that came down. Mm -hmm. Isaac, uh, he gets even more specific here when he said Isaac and Rebekah before they had conceived. So now you have the same father, Isaac, and the same mother, twins in the womb. There's nothing separating them. This is the point he's going to make. There's no difference. It's the same father, same mother. And yet you have here God choosing, electing Jacob over Esau. And not only that, he's saying... He's acknowledging they weren't even born. They hadn't even done anything good or bad. So that those factors weren't, weren't mm -hmm. factors in why God chose Jacob over Esau. He says the reason is that God's purpose of election might continue. Even further stressing, not because of works. It wasn't anything they were did, anything they did. They hadn't even been born yet. But it's because of him who calls. That's why she, Rebecca, was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. So does that make sense so far? Any questions or comments? Well, 
I think in today's society, like verse 14, what then shall we say? Is there injustice on God's part? People today don't want to think there's even any justice about God. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry is going to go to heaven. They think. Sure. Because a loving God right. would not send somebody to hell. Right. God's love is put on a pedestal. His justice is, is kept yeah. out of the picture. Sure. And, and I think that's the society that, that we're living in. And I don't mean that we should preach, you know, the old hellfire and that damnation, but we do have to be honest mm -hmm. about what the Word says. Right. As Paul would say, we need to preach a full-orbed gospel that takes into account all of God's attributes, all of his character traits that he's revealed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that reference there, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Um, very difficult, very offensive to a lot of people as well, that God would even say that. What's fascinating to me, one of the things that I've learned and has been really transformative in my understanding of this is, you know, prior, before I, before I studied this as much as I did and um, came to understand what's being expressed here, that Esau I hated was the part that I struggled with. Mm -hmm. That was just sounded very harsh. Mm -hmm. And that's where I, my attention focused. Jacob I loved, yes, because mm -hmm. that's all I've grown up with is the God of love. But Esau, I hated. How do I reckon with that? And um, someone said it was it was Dr. James White who was talking about this passage. He said, "What should shock us is the Jacob I loved part, because Jacob was no better than Esau." Again, that's the argument Paul's making. There is no distinguishing factor. God didn't choose Jacob, didn't love Jacob, and hate Esau because Esau was a bad person and did bad things, and Jacob wasn't. Mm -hmm. They were both in the same boat. They're both equal on yeah. all accounts. Um, so taking into account the biblical teaching of what we've been discussing a little bit, this doctrine of total depravity, that all in Adam after the fall are born in sin, mm -hmm. the playing field is equal. We all deserve God's justice and his wrath and mm -hmm. punishment for all eternity. Mm -hmm. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We've all Come broken his law. Yeah, absolutely. So that's why the fact that God set his love upon Jacob and not Esau, that's really the amazing thing of that sentence, that he chose Jacob. Yeah. So let, let's take a, a step further and just talk through something, if you would. Mm -hmm. So. Esau, hey, I, you know, I, I don't know for sure where he ended up, but let, let's say that, that he was hell bound. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so not only was Jacob <coughs> chosen and loved, but was Esau created, predestined to burn in hell. Right. Right. I'm just writing that down so I. I mean, the short answer is yes. And actually, that's what we're coming to next. Was I, I hear that in Paul's predestination language, okay, but, but I don't see that in any of the attributes given to God throughout the Bible outs, outside of this predestination, or at least how we as humans describe predestination, how we interpret Paul's language uh, and so that is the challenge in my mind I mean I, I I understand we have a God that hates sin that hates anything I mean he, he, he's very capable of hating no doubt about that right did he create people specifically to burn in hell right and you're saying also you don't see this anywhere else in scripture I, I i mean it's tough for me to see it outside of this predestination language that paul talks about when i when i read about god's attributes throughout the old testament or it's pretty specific in labeling attributes mm -hmm. you know and and it's a it's a god of wrath and it's a a, a, a jealous god it's a god very capable of, of destruction okay and he right. shows it time after time right but 
this whole idea of saying I'm going to create this person to burn in hell I that I don't see described in the attributes outside of Paul's predestination okay that's good good uh, good question valid question so let's let's pause and let's look at that um, First of all, let me start with the remainder of this passage because Paul's going to get to that. And then I'd like to go to specifically some Old Testament passages that I have here. So, if we continue on, first of all, I just want to note that at verse 14 and verse 19, Paul presupposes two questions that his supposed listeners are going to ask. And the reason he's doing that is because we can only assume he's heard these questions before and he knows this is what it comes down to. And I think that's very profound and shows that if we read what I just read in Romans 9, 11 through uh, 13, in Jacob I love Esau, I hate it. If we're tracking with what it says and on the same wavelength as what Paul is communicating here, we would naturally come up with these two questions ourselves. Mm-hmm. So you could put it another way. If the God you worship, if you would not ask these questions of that God because he's all loving, because he is fair in the sense that we think of fair, and he allows us the choice freely, and we're the ultimate deciders of our fate. The free will of us ultimately is the deciding factor, ultimately I'm speaking now. These two questions don't come up with that view of God because that would be fair to us. So again, the fact that these two questions are being addressed goes against our notions of what is fair. Okay, so let me me just read here. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? Paul's answer is by no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. So he's quoting from the Old Testament here, Exodus chapter 9, verse 16. So here's our first, really, R.D., perhaps a, a reference that can help us. I will have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. Right. And that to- ties to the total depravity. I mean, I, I can reconcile that in my mind very easily, that we are all depraved. We have right. done nothing to earn this, right. a- and it's by God's Grace. Grace alone. Yeah. Uh, just two, eight, nine. For it's by grace I've been saved through, through faith. faith. Okay, yeah. but it's that faith piece. Right. You know, mm-hmm. and, and this not of yourselves. Not of yourselves. It, right. it is the, the gift, gift of God, God yeah. not by works. Right. Lest any man be saved. So that no man may boast. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and so it is, you still have that faith piece thrown in there right. that is required, that is a, a, a conscientious decision that we are faced with a responsibility we are to take mm-hmm. and and if we don't we're facing God's wrath in a, in a big big way right I mean we might make that decision still face God's wrath in some ways but right. I mean we're hell bound basically right if we don't make put that faith in there. and that faith is just reiterated Romans 5 1 Romans 1 17 by Paul hey listen this is our responsibility you've got to take this faith piece okay and then trying to reconcile that with God made this person to burn in hell Mm -hmm. I I, I, I have trouble just enunciating faith to my understanding in that passage is a gift yeah it's not our choosing yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. No, I and, and I get that piece too. Okay, but but no, still, we don't choose. God gives us the faith to choose. And that was a hard thing. I remember back when we were in Mound, Minnesota, at Campus Crusade training, we had long discussions about whether mm-hmm. this person had the gift of faith, and another person wouldn't have the gift of faith. Mm-hmm. We had a lot of discussions. And I agree about it's that. a gift. I, I mean, I agree it all comes to God. But, but I would argue that us as humans are limited in a very finite way to describe God's infinite dis- definition of predestination. That we as humans spend a lot of time trying to define this predestination maybe beyond what is specifically in the Bible, in our minds, in our finite minds, 
we are trying to box in an infinite God is, is my concern with some of the predestination conversation. Right. Because if you say that, if it is a gift from God, then what? what is my responsibility on earth? Why should I right. care? I mean, God's going to put it but in. But R.D., that's, look at verse 19. That is the exact question Paul knows. He's heard, and he's going to af- offer a response. Yeah. I mean, that tells me a lot. I, I myself, R.D., had that exact same question you're raising. I mean, I struggled through these things. And it just, I think it says something very profound, that that exact question, because I think what you're getting at, R.D., Strip all these layers aside. It comes down to this issue. All of this about predestination and God and man and all of this comes down to this question. Verse 19. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who can resist his will? Why is that question being asked? Because that's what Paul's teaching about God. That's why. Now, let me go back, though. Well, but then he responds there. He follows up with my argument. <laughs> hey, we as people are going to define God? We as the clay are going to define the potter? No way. You no, no, can't no, do no. it. No, we as the clay are going to listen to what the potter has. Well, well I know, but what, what Paul says here is we better not, as the clay, try and define the potter. And, and, and that's, that <laughs> is the flip side of what you just say. I mean, you say what I said. Hey, that played right into this? Well, I'm saying what you say plays right into the same passage, too. Who are you? Okay? Right. And so I am, I am not to the point where I'm saying, why does God still blame us? Who, who resists his will? I'm saying I'm taking responsibility for, biblically, all these passages that say, these are your responsibilities, okay? I can't, in my mind, <coughs> define God's predestination and how that ties in to my responsibilities. I, as a human, I, and, and that's exactly what Paul's saying here. But who are you, old man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to who is formed? Up? Why did you make me like this? Right, but uh, keep reading, R.D., because it's going to get even more specific. <coughs> has the potter, look at verse 21, has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? Verse 22, what if God, what if God, desiring to show his wrath, to make known his power, desiring to do this, yeah. has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction mm-hmm. in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Yeah, no, That's where getting... I'm using that to answer this question. <coughs> Was Esau predestined to hell? <coughs> this is just, and this is not all. This is a starting point. No, and I, and I get it, and I hear all that. All I'm saying is, that does not take away my responsibility. Well, you're 100 percent right in that. Okay, and I can't. You're 100 percent right. I don't believe I can, and I don't believe any man can totally reconcile this idea of my responsibilities versus God's predestinate. So why am I worried about my responsibilities? Okay, which I believe Paul is saying here too, that that God, the Potter is much more complicated than us as clay figures that he's created. And we as clay figures are sitting here second-guessing and questioning. Well, no, 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 no. I'm I'm with you 100% on everything you're saying except that. I'm not second-guessing God. My whole point here is letting God speak. Why is this passage so neglected? I want to bring this out. I was the just fact that God is a potter, I want to make known right. because he's my God, and I want to honor him and what he's revealed. Yeah. So, I mean, 99% of everything you're saying, I'm in absolute agreement with. Mm-hmm. But I'm, and my whole point is only letting Scripture speak, so I'm not putting words, no, and I'm not trying to put them, in, this, I mean, this put them in a box. The truth. This is the truth. Right. Uh, but... I guess my concern is, and I'll leave it at that, my yeah. concern is that some of this predestination language or talk uh, eliminates the responsibility mm-hmm. of us as humans has a tendency. I'm not saying you specifically, I'm not saying, yeah. I'm just saying yeah. I think we have to be careful. Otherwise, why should we care? It's all predestined. We, we, we do this a lot. We think about, well, our, our, our life, we'll just show yeah. it. I don't need to evangelize or I don't need to present the gospel because well they'll just see it by, by my life 
No. We still need to evangelize. Still. Right. We can't depend upon. Well, and again, I'm total agreement with you. This doctrine, predestination, which is a biblical doctrine, it's not man-made word that humans came up with to try to explain God, needs to be handled with great care. And perhaps that is one reason why it's so, so neglected. Only one reason, though. I think, and I am convinced, the other reason is because it's offensive. Mm -hmm. Because it takes control away from me. Not responsibility. I agree with you. There's predestination and the fact that God has foreordained everything that comes to pass. Yet, he has done so in a way to where man is still responsible for his actions. And again, you have those key passages of Scripture, Joseph and his brothers in Genesis 50. You meant it for evil. You will be held accountable for that. That was your sin. You did that out of the desires of your heart emanating from a sinful nature. You hated me. Yet, God meant it. He didn't work with it. He didn't work around it. He meant it for good. Two things were happening at the same time there. God's plan was being perfectly executed. Along with that, at the same time, men were making decisions that they will be held accountable for on Judgment Day. Yeah. Both. Which, which, which takes me back to the idea that if we, we believe that, we should be incredibly humble. I mean, just so Absolutely. incredibly Absolutely. humble right. that what I do to try and whatever, I mean, everybody has a different definition of success. Whatever I do to accomplish mm -hmm. what God put me on this earth to accomplish, he's got different plans, mm -hmm. okay? And, and, and what, what ultimately accomplishes his will is, is I'm not going to sit around and decide. And so that should make me so, so humble to recognize his power, his authority, his control. Yeah. Uh, well, and in every good work we do has yeah. been predestined by him. That's the, the other part of Ephesians chapter 2. The good works that he prepared in advance for that us, that we should do. walk in them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very humbling. Yeah, And so whenever even the predestination is, is, is preached and talked about, I just feel like, man, that should really, really be coming from a humble, humble heart. Absolutely. To, to communicate that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, you touched on faith and works here. Um, the idea that if God is predestined, then I don't need to worry about doing anything. That's just simply an unbiblical. If whoever that person would be, and they're out there, I know, who would say that would need to be shown that that's an unbiblical response in the sense that the relationship between faith and works is this. Our works do not merit salvation. But, however, our works, our good works, are a demonstration of true saving faith. Mm -hmm. You see the difference? Sure. I mean, James talks about you can have faith, but it can be demon faith. It can be dead faith that produces no works. You say, I have faith, but you have no works that you do. <coughs> the understanding is those works don't in any way, shape, or form earn God's love, merit his love, merit salvation, but they are the fruit of a truly changed person who has been regenerated by the Holy Spirit, born again. Does that make sense? So there is an important relationship between faith and works. And again, this is just what Scripture teaches here. Uh, as I've been taught by my teachers and mentors and my pastor. Um, okay, I want to move forward here because I want to get to the other verses, the other passages here. So the first question Paul asked, verse 14, is there injustice on God's part? I didn't get all the way through this. His answer is by no means, verse 15, for he says to Moses again, I will have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it does not depend on human will, it does not depend on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I raised you up so that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Verse 18, so then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. Now keep in mind, Pharaoh was hardened, but he was not hardened 
God did not harden his heart because Pharaoh had already hardened his heart himself. God told Moses before he even went to Egypt, he was going to harden Pharaoh's heart because he had a purpose for him, for Pharaoh. So that little block there, Paul's answer to the first question, is there injustice on God's part, is pretty mind-blowing. Um, and we see here God using people like Pharaoh, raising him up. You think of all those years as a kid and growing up as Pharaoh over Egypt. Uh, well, Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, that's the one Nebuchadnezzar. That me. All for a purpose that God was going to bring about. And those are some of the supporting texts I want to bring to mind, like from the prophet Isaiah, where God says, what I have purposed, I will bring about. What I have said, that I will do. I will accomplish all my good pleasure. To Nebuchadnezzar, he says, uh, I do as I please with the powers of heaven and the people of the earth. No one can hold back my hand or say to me, what have you done? So the biblical understanding of the doctrine of God as he's revealed himself is he does as he pleases. Ultimately, he is free and sovereign. And this passage here, taken from Exodus 9, is when, Pope, when Moses asked God on the mountain to show him his glory. God showed him his glory by saying, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. That was part of his showing Moses his glory. And the idea being expressed that God's glory or interwoven with it or an aspect of his glory is his absolute freedom and sovereignty over that which he has made, including people. God reigns. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Psalm 3, verse 5. Now, verse 18 again, so he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. Well, verse 19, you will say to me then, well, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? that's the case, why are we still blamed? Well, Paul's answer, verse 20. Who are you, O oh man, who answers back to God? It took me a long time to really get the gist of this because at first it seemed to me a cop-out. He wasn't really giving an answer. He was just saying basically, be quiet. Who are you? Just be silent. Thanks be to God. Um, over time, he has showed me that that is the most appropriate answer. God is our Paul, God through Paul, is reminding us that yes, we are mere creatures. God is the creator, and as creator, he has absolute sovereign rights over what he has made. So Paul says, Who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay? to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of, the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? Now, a couple of supporting texts here I want to get to. Isaiah 29, 16. Isaiah 29, 16. You have here, oh, this is great. Isaiah 29, 16. Isaiah saying, You turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay, that the thing made should say of its maker, He did not make me? Isaiah 45, 9 through 12. Woe to him. When Paul says here, but who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Look at Isaiah 45, 9. Woe to him who strives with him who formed him, a pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making, or your work has no handles? And look, skip down to verse 11b, the second part of verse 11. Ask me of things to come. Will you command me concerning my children and the work of my hands. I made the earth and created man on it. It was my hands that stretched out the heavens and I commanded all their host. And then look at Proverbs 16.4. Proverbs 16.4.
the Lord, Lord has made everything for his purpose, even the wicked in the day of trouble. Right. <laughs> the Lord <coughs> has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. That's so right. that ties into Paul's statement here that he has made prepared vessels of wrath for destruction. That ultimately, in the ultimate sense, that yes, God, being sovereign ruler of all things, has predestined everything. He has foreordained to have mercy on whom he will have mercy. And he has elected with the rest to pass over them and allow them to die in their sin, which they deserve. We not only don't deserve to respond to the gospel, we don't even deserve as human beings, no matter what tribe, nation, or tongue, to even hear and have the opportunity to respond. God would be fully just and righteous to just wipe us out, as he did in the flood, keeping only Noah and his family through the door of the ark. couple more texts. Jeremiah 18, 1 through 6 is the potter and the clay where, though it says here uh, Jeremiah 18, starting at verse 1, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Arise and go down to the potter's house and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house and there he was working at his wheel and the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand and he reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to do. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O Israel. Isaiah 29, 16, we read already, you turn things upside down, shall the potter be regarded as the clay? Um, we read Isaiah 45, to Job, out of Job 40, verses 6 through 9. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Dress for action like a man, and I will question you, and you make it known to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? Have you an arm like God, and can you thunder with a voice like his? Then I will also acknowledge to you that your own right hand can save you. <clears throat> Isaiah 45, 6 to 7, I am the Lord, there is no other. I form the light and I create darkness. I bring prosperity and I create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. Amos 3, 6, does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? Jeremiah 32, for thus says the Lord, just as I have brought all this disaster upon this people, so I will bring upon them all the good that I promised them. So, what I'm trying to shed light on here is God's sovereign predestination for ordaining of all things, that he has in fact done that. And although these are hard questions to answer, like, did God ultimately predestine Esau to hell? The answer has to be yes. It has to be. When we think of how dark sometimes this culture is, um, but then God's word is the light. Mm -hmm. For the light shines brightest in the darkness. Right. I think of that. And and we want to let God's word, all of it, shine not just specific or certain passages that we think are the light, but all of God's attributes. And we want to have our thinking be built upon a solid foundation of God's Word, going only so far as God's Word allows it. Because from God's Word, we know that although He has foreordained everything to come to pass, He has done so without being the author of sin. Flat out, He just says that. So we know that. And yet there is evil in the world. And God planned yeah, with that, evil. That's a tough one where he's not the author of sin. Right. And so sin the, entered the world because of 
<coughs> and because as a tough, maybe that's not the word to use, but as a result, mm -hmm. basically as a consequence of mm -hmm. man's actions. Right, right, exactly. So how do you reconcile that with? Right. Kind of didn't do it. And that's where, I mean, again, I, there's just a piece there that I'm not, I don't believe there's a human mind can reconcile that. And I agree there, <coughs> right. And so in my mind, I hold both of those things. Truth. I just hold them because yeah. they're both true. I know it's true that God did not create evil because the word clearly mm -hmm. tells me that. I equally know that God has foreordained whatsoever comes to pass because God's word equally. I don't have to. And yeah, I think that, this that, is getting what you're exactly getting at. Where, uh, I don't at. have to. Yeah. But the reason I'm bringing these passages up, specifically Romans 9, is because they're not, this pre, it's not being preached. Christians don't know about it. They have preconceived notions, limited knowledge, and it's being kept in the closet, so to speak. And I don't, that's not right. I know that's not right. Now, I was going to say, I don't think that's right. I know it's not right. It's wrong to not teach, again, carefully this The whole precious, counsel of God. The whole counsel of God. Jason, uh, what does this imply relative to baptism of infants? I don't know, you have to help me with the connection. <clears throat> what, is, what is baptism for? Infant baptism. Okay. All right, now Fred, I know you well enough. Are you switching gears here and I need to no. go with you and really switch gears into a discussion on baptism or do you have a specific point that you're relating that to this? <laughs> I'm just a, asking for clarity. I think there's an assumption that in baptism God identifies with that child. God the election is shown by human activity. Well, I, I, I know. I think that's a big discussion. Right. Roman Catholic idea of baptism is that it is salvific. Um, yeah. Protestant understanding of salvific is, I'm not aware of any denomination Protestant wise that would say that by baptizing your child, you're somehow forcing God's hand. Um, no, there's none I'm aware of. Presbyterian or Baptist, who both do believe differently. But believe there, there is some scripture reference to the Holy Spirit coming upon at, at, at baptism. Again, is this prescriptive or descriptive at that right. time? Maybe that's the next study, Jason. Maybe we talk about baptism when the Holy Spirit comes upon you at, at, and how it's described in the Bible. Maybe that could be our next one. Yeah, it could be. Now, of course, if the Holy Spirit coming upon you at baptism of course, would not negate in any way predestination because we would simply say that God foreordained meant for that to happen at a specific point in time. Yeah. But if it's, a, if it's a more of a public confession of faith, would it Holy Spirit come upon you? And yeah, that would be. Christ, that, I know. feel that would be a separate and very interesting discussion to have. But but, but but there's some New Testament descriptions of where the Holy Spirit came on that it looks like it's apparent after. Salvation, yeah, right? You yeah, know, I mean, I mean, not at the time of salvation, but like down the road a little bit. There's right. some descriptions, so it's a, it's a tough concept to, yeah. pin down, right? See, Jason, I'm asking, why baptize infants? Is he going to be condemned? Now? Right, and again, that's a fascinating topic. But that's a, you're talking about the Presbyterian position on baptism, well, right? No, I'm just telling you. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. Presbyterian believe in infant baptism. Of course, Baptists would believe in believer's baptism. The way the Presbyterian would explain it to you, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm not an expert, of course, but they, by baptizing that baby, are welcoming him into the covenant community of the church. They know that that in no way, shape, or form guarantees or increases the odds of that baby being, you know, somewhere down the road or somewhere in time saved by God's act of mercy. Yeah, I can only accept that in the in the church if they bring in the family. Yeah. And we have had grandmothers who want their children baptized. Grandchildren, Grandchildren baptized. 
But you go to the parents and they say, oh, if you want to baptize my kid, it's okay, but don't ask me to be a part of it. Well, that's when we say no baptism. Right, right. To me, it's really the same as what we grew up with was, you know, having a dedication and it's you are willing to teach that child. So that is common in your church, baby baptism? We have, we have baby baptism. We do. But in my mind, I don't see it that way. I see it more of as a dedication of, there is this covenant thing, but what do you think, Fred? Well, the minister's Jason said, makes it clear that it's about a commitment of the parent. Yeah. So whether you call it baptism or dedication or Something yes, else? except for the fact that in the Protestant religion coming out of the Reformation, which that's why we're, we call ourselves Protestants, baptism is considered to be a sacrament or an ordinance mm -hmm. together with the Lord's Supper mm -hmm. that are to be observed by mm -hmm. God's covenant people within a church. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, if a person wanted to distinguish that from a, a, believer, a dedication, that would be fine, but that would be something else. You would be dedicating your child. Again, it wouldn't force God's hand to save that child, but it would be an act of the parents saying, hey, you know, let's gather around. We want to dedicate, you know. Uh, Is there really any examples you can cite in the Bible of whether it's child baptism or child dedications? Any, any examples? The differentiation there? Well, differentiation, but is there an example of either one, even if there's not a differentiation? See, R.D., you asked the right question. You said, is there anywhere in the Bible you can show that? That's, <laughs> that's the way we, we ought to think. Process. That's right. Show me in the Bible where that says that. A absolutely. Um, again, what 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 are you looking for in Scripture? Well, just uh, a a a a baby or perhaps child, either baptism or dedication, something that describes either a baby baptism or child baptism or child baptism yeah. or dedication. Yeah, dedication. I, I mean the Presbyterian's going to give you some scriptures. Uh, they're both going to agree, Baptist and Presbyterian, there are no definitive scriptures that say this is it. They're each going to point to different things. From my limited knowledge, the Presbyterian is going to point to the Old Covenant of uh, circumcision and how children were circumcised into the covenant community of Israel. Mm -hmm. And so going from that covenant to the covenant of grace, they carry that along. And they have a biblical precedent to show their justification for that. I just, I'm not well versed in it. Right, right, right. I, I well, think circumcision just seems like a totally different act as described in the Bible versus well, Baptist. You're speaking like right. Baptist, yeah. which the Baptist would say, no, 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 that was totally different. The Presbyterian would say, no, 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 they're similar, they are different, but there are striking similarities that need to be taken into account. That would be another. Yeah, I am, I, listen, I, I baptized Ari, Eli, and Wyatt last year. Because As I work with them, and I we prayed and we studied, and they professed faith. That's right. Mm -hmm. I then had them. I did not, even though Jude was born, did not have him baptized. Now the particular church I go to is made up of Presbyterians and Baptists both. It's a rare denomination called the C E C R E C. And we're all fine with that. We're just not allowing that to be a source of division. Mm -hmm. But I, I I studied. It was a tough decision. I had all four of them. What am I going to do here? I looked into it to the point where I felt that was the right thing to do, but I still want to look into it more. There's people I very highly respect. R.C. Sproul, who's a Presbyterian, believes in infant baptism, and others. And they make a very compelling case. Where is the passage that says they were circumcised, but they don't have the gift? Makes a distinction. They were circumcising all the children. Yeah. Oh, right, right, right. But not all Israel are Israel. Right. Just because they were circumcised, that was an outward sign. God's looking for the circumcision of the heart. Is that in Romans? I believe so. In other places, yeah. Okay, wait. I don't know how we got off of God's sovereignty on That's the circumcision. No more asking questions, it's Fred. It's Fred. <laughs> for the record, it's Fred. It, it has to do with it. Yeah, well, yeah. I wanted to tie really quickly Albert Moeller. 
I think the tie-in. That was Fred's original question. What's that got to do with the? Well, yeah, his on. original question. Then he somehow <laughs> got into circumcision. Yeah. He's talking about the mushy middle, given our culture today. The churches, and he mentioned seeker sensitive, this modern church movement of wanting to please everybody and be nice, that mushy middle is going away as the cultural pressures increase. True, whole counsel of God, full orb preaching is the answer to that, that people need more and more today that he was hitting on. That was kind of my loose tie-in. I only have a minute now because Fred was talking about circumcision. Um, child baptism. <laughs> Yes. All right. Hey, That's great lesson, time. man. That all was right. a good day. Cool. Cool. Yeah, have something to think about, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, uh, your dad got home about 11 o'clock. Hey, good. Well, when I was texting them, they were on the road headed this way, so the surgery went well. well so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think he I was feeling like that battery was slowing him down a little. I don't know if that's true or not, so it'll be interesting to see if he yeah. feels a little more pep with the new battery or not. Hopefully well, that's the case. The kids have loved fishing. Oh my <laughs> right? gosh, Good. they have loved that fishing. Good. And uh, they, I didn't run them up there this morning. They went by foot, running. Good but, for I them. Told, but I told Alex, you know, your mother ran all the way to Chain of Lakes yeah, when she was yeah, your age. Yeah. <laughs> So, so he do doesn't know where Shannon Lakes is. Yeah, but, right, right, right. <laughs> but I, I was trying to say it won't hurt you. That's right. <laughs> Did they?